Good afternoon. Um, my name's Julie Jodowin Krozik, and I, as a member of the BCC Multicultural Committee and a learning specialist out of the Office of Disability Services, would like to welcome you to this afternoon's event entitled Living with ALS. Thank you for coming. Today, I first want you to know that the Multicultural Committee has selected disability awareness as one of its goals for this 2010-2011 calendar year. And in doing that, we were thrilled to be able to unite with the One Book Initiative and bring in speakers who could really talk about ALS. During the month of October, the nation celebrates disability employment awareness, and BCC is going to be celebrating that as well. Today is our kickoff to that celebration. And again, thank you for participating. Now, I'd like to hand things over to one of the co-chairs of the One Book Initiative, Gabby Adler. Thank you, Julie. We're very grateful to the Multicultural Committee for funding this event and for working with us. And I think it's a great example of the way that the One Book Project brings people together, all the diverse uh, areas of the college get together through their shared reading. And the book that was chosen this year, our second year for one book, was of course Tuesdays with Maury. And um, I would like to thank all of you for coming. And also, uh, I have a couple of announcements before we start. One is uh, to thank Professor Johanna DuPont and the whole AT OTA team for all of their efforts uh, in uh, supporting the One Book program this year, and Professor DuPont has a couple of things she'd like to tell you. Thank you. First one has to do with food and supporting the OTA club. There is a bake sale outside on a donation basis in the lobby of C building, so it's just around this room if you want to grab a snack at the end. And also, I just wanted to explain about the certificates of attendance. This is the first time that we're doing that. Um, we've, we're providing certificate of attendance, which can be used by those of you who are licensed professionals. And it's good for one contact hour, one PDP, which is a professional development point, or point one CEUs. This presentation hasn't been approved by any um, professional organization, but this is the type of thing you can submit when you apply for relicensure and recertification. Certainly in the Occupational Therapy as Assistant Program, we require professional development of all our students, so this is one way the students can show they've been attending outside professional development. So if you are in need of one of these, you need to sign in um, as you leave to show that you stayed for the entire um, seminar, and then you'll receive your certificate. Best of luck with that. Thank you, Johanna. We will be having other One Book events, and uh, we hope that you keep track of that by checking the One Book Facebook page and also the college's One Book page for upcoming events uh, to which you are all cordially invited. This year's choice, uh, Tuesdays with Maury, was certainly the overwhelming choice of uh, people voting for our One Book selection. And as a community of learners, I think we're lifelong learners, and so we have a great opportunity uh, today to learn more about living with ALS. Uh, there are many lessons in that book, and that certainly is one of them. I'd like to mention, too, that this is really a uh, multidisciplinary kind of experience because we have at least um, 30 instructors in 15 disciplines. Uh, who are working with this book this semester. And we're very fortunate to have two speakers here today who will share their expertise and their special knowledge with us so that we can learn more about living with ALS. Karen Baker is a social worker with the ALS Association, Massachusetts chapter. Karen has uh, a master's in social work and has been with the association for several years. And uh, Laura Tuttle is a registered nurse with a uh, bachelor's uh, science degree in nursing and an MBA. And so uh, we look forward to hearing them uh, share their knowledge with us. I invite you to, uh, 
to join me in welcoming them to our college today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start off by talking just a little bit about the agency I work for, the ALS Association Mass Chapter. We're a very, very small nonprofit agency based in Norwood by Gillette Stadium. And I wish I could tell you that we have a whole team of nurses, home health aides, the physical and occupational therapists who take care of people with ALS, but we don't. What we have is a couple of social workers, and we offer consultation, guidance, education, emotional support to people with ALS. You'll hear that it's a very rare, unusual orphan disease. It doesn't seem that way to me. At any point in time, we are working with about 250 people around the state who have been diagnosed with ALS. And there's a lot more people that are not officially diagnosed or haven't chosen to contact us. We think, based on the statistics, there could be as many people as, in Massachusetts, as five or 600 people with ALS. Um, we're very excited to be here today because we are always looking to do outreach and find more people with ALS and connect with them. And I'm very excited because I know a lot of you are going into careers, um, especially in healthcare. So the more people that know about ALS, the easier it is to help support the people with ALS who need that care. Um, basically what our agency does, um, without billing insurance or without charging for services, we offer support in a couple different forms. If I'm given the name of someone with ALS, I offer to drive out to their home, meet with them and their family, we have books and DVDs, information about ALS. A lot of people have been diagnosed with it and have never heard of it, don't know the details of the disease or what is coming down the road for them. So our first step is always to offer education. We have a recycled equipment program. People have donated power chairs, hospital beds, walker wheelchairs, things like that to us. And we like to recycle them, bring them back out to people who can use them again. So that's a very practical, concrete service. The other part is offering emotional support. Um, this can be done on a home visit, um, talking with the family. I um, do some monthly support groups. We offer educational seminars. So a small variety of things that we do. Um, people with ALS need a lot more support than what we can offer. So people also, also go to um, you know, neurologists, hospital clinics. They'll be working with visiting nurse, hospice. Many people in the medical profession are needed to help. I'm going to read you a list of facts about ALS, and please don't feel you have to write them all down. I have copies of it if anybody wants it. If there's one thing I'd like you to write down, it is our agency's website, and I'll give you that. It's www.als-ma.org, and again, that's www.als-ma.org. If you are looking for more information about ALS, we'd love you to come visit the website. Um, that can also connect you through to a lot more information that you'll need. Our Massachusetts chapter is part of a nationwide effort to assist people with ALS. So you'll find a chapter covering every state, and our national headquarters are in Washington, DC. So we do try to offer coverage throughout the whole country for people. Um, Another thing that we have that is an important program is what's called advocacy. And having worked in healthcare for many years, I didn't know much about advocacy or think much about it. I was used to working in a setting where I had someone that was identified as a patient in front of me, and we thought, what, do they, what does the patient need? And we just thought about the patients in our building, under our roof, under our care. And advocacy has been a great learning experience for me to step back and to look at what are the policies and the laws and the healthcare insurance regulations that don't support people with ALS and how can we change them. And Laura and I have had the opportunity, we go to the State House here in Massachusetts every year to request things that the politicians vote on. And Laura and I were also in Washington, D.C. this past spring, also asking at the national level for our elected representatives to vote on things that would positively impact people with ALS. And as a healthcare provider, I hadn't really thought about what were the politics or who was elected and who was voting on what, so that's been a great opportunity for me. Um, when I went to Washington, D.C. two years ago, we asked that our Congress support an improved package for veterans diagnosed with ALS. I was in Washington, D.C. in May, and in September we heard that the government had approved that the veterans diagnosed with ALS would get a better veterans benefit package. So. It was really different for me to sit back and see, thank you. 
So it was really different for me to step out of what I had done as a social worker, just looking face to face at patients and thinking about just what that individual needed to looking back at the whole picture of what are lawyers doing, what are politicians doing, what are advocates doing. And that's another way you can get involved if you're on our website. Um, sometimes we are looking for people to uh, write letters, email, or call their elected representatives and ask for things to be voted on that support people with disabilities and people in healthcare. So that's a very interesting way to get involved too if you're not thinking, well, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a physical therapist, what can I do to help? That's a great way for everyone to get involved. So I'm gonna go through some facts, and again, please don't feel you have to write them down. These are statistics that are compiled by our National ALS Association. ALS stands for Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis. We call it in this country, Lou Gehrig's disease is its nickname. More people know it by that name. ALS is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and the spinal cord. The progressive degeneration of the motor neurons in ALS eventually lay to their death. When the motor neurons die, the ability of the brain to initiate and control muscle movement is lost. Inevitably, a person afflicted with ALS loses the ability to walk, speak, move, swallow, and breathe. And I know that was very technical, and again, I don't want you to feel you have to write all this down. I am coming back in December to speak to one of the occupational therapy classes, and if you are in other classes in healthcare, nursing, et cetera, um, I'd be happy to come back. I have a more detailed PowerPoint presentation that talks about some of these medical issues. So that was the most detailed one. We got through that. As ALS progresses, the mind and senses usually remain completely intact, and the patient essentially becomes a prisoner of her, his or her own body. And that's not to say that there aren't some people with ALS who have dementia or memory loss, but for the most part, someone with ALS, they are aware of everything going on around them, but they're not able to communicate back. So that can be very, very frustrating for people. The initial symptoms include tripping, difficulty gripping, general clumsiness, difficulty swallowing, and weight loss. Um, one of the challenging things with ALS is that it can often take someone six to 12 months to be diagnosed with ALS. Uh, sometimes people have gone to their doctors and they can sense something is not right. The doctor may or may not be able to pick up right away that it's ALS. People often go for extensive testing for six to 12 months to hear the diagnosis. So that's another very frustrating part of it. Every 90 minutes, someone is diagnosed with ALS, and every 90 minutes, someone loses their life to ALS. It is estimated that 30,000 Americans are living with ALS. Roughly 5,600 people are diagnosed in the United States each year. Um, the average age at diagnosis is 55. They'll tell you that the age range is 40 to 70. I met a woman who was diagnosed at 22, and I met another lady who was diagnosed at 98. So it can affect people at all ages. Individuals who have served in the military are twice as likely to develop ALS as those who have not served. Uh, we don't know why that is, but we have been working closely with the veterans associations to try to offer more research in that area. There are two forms of ALS, sporadic and familial. Sporadic means we don't know why you have ALS. It doesn't run in your family, we don't know why you got it. With ALS, there at this point is no known cause or reason of why someone gets it. In five to 10% of the cases, it does run in the family for several generations. But at this point, the research has not pointed out why someone can have it. So basically, that means anybody here in this room could be diagnosed with ALS. It can affect anyone, any age, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, Again, there's no known cause, cure, effective treatment. We talk about managing the symptoms and helping people stay as comfortable as possible. The average lifespan of a person after diagnosis is two to five years, and again, that's a statistic. Many people have ALS for a while before it's diagnosed. I've met some people that died three months after being diagnosed. We have some people who've been living 10 to 15 years, and again, we don't know why that is or what causes the difference in the lifespan. Right now, the only FDA-approved drug is called Rylatec, and it is not a cure. It is only thought to slow down the symptoms of ALS to make it a little more manageable. The average statistic is that people who take this medication 
might live another three months. And uh, one of the concerns with the medication is that it can be very expensive. It might not be covered by your insurance. I've had people tell me they have paid $300 for a month's supply of a drug that might give them three more months to live. So that's another challenge facing people with ALS. It's estimated that the average yearly cost of care for a person living with ALS is between $200,000, $250,000. I'm sure most of us don't have that extra amount of money sitting around in our checking account that we could hire for private aids, but that is the cost if you were to require to pay someone to take care of you. Um, insurance benefits might cover a small amount of home care, a small amount of visiting nurse, a small amount of hospice, but basically someone with ALS towards the end really can't be left home alone and needs around-the-clock care, um, and that often falls on the families um, to help provide that care. Um, generally, with people with ALS, they find that they have to really just give away their privacy and let anyone and anyone in to help take care of them. So many times it's a coverage of shift of different family members. Someone comes Monday, someone comes Tuesday, somebody sleeps overnight. So it really does take family, neighbors, and friends to help take care of someone with ALS. Those are some of the physical issues, and I also want to touch on some of the issues pertaining to mental health or emotional issues. ALS causes depression and anxiety. You might be thinking, well, of course, if I heard I had a terminal illness, I'm depressed or I'm nervous or I'm worried who's paying for this or how is my family taking care of that. It's more than it's just that you're having a reaction to hearing that you have this disease. It's that um, ALS is changing the way messages go from your brain to your body, so it's also very physical, it's very real that as your body chemistry is changing, that depression and anxiety are more common with people with ALS. People often have to decide if they want to have treatment, an anti-anxiety or anti-depression medication or counseling. This brings on to what Laura's going to talk about is a lot of the different choices. I can give you these statistics and figures and facts about ALS, and it's interesting to hear. But what it comes down to is that every person diagnosed with ALS has to make some very big decisions. Um, the hardest part of my job, but the part that I feel the most privileged to have, is that many people need to discuss with me or someone else um, the biggest decision they've made of their life of if they have ALS, and there isn't a cure as of today, do they wish to extend their life with supports or treatments such as a trach, a ventilator, a feeding tube? And these are very personal decisions to make, and someone has to consider um, religious values, cultural, ethnicity, backgrounds, um, what their family feels, how old are they? Um, but it's a very big decision for someone to make. Um, do I want to have a machine breathe for me and keep me alive? Or do I want to decide that I'm ready to say goodbye to my friends and family and have hospice? Uh, so that's a huge decision for people to make. It can often cause a lot of stress um, within a family. I've worked with a lot of families where maybe the person with the ALS is choosing one route and the family, the spouse, grandparents, someone else is saying choose something else. So that's, I think, one of the most emotional decisions that people have to make is how they wish to live with the ALS, and that's why I was really glad that today was called Living with ALS, um, and Laura's gonna talk a lot more about the emotional issues and some of the choices that we hope every person diagnosed with ALS has the right to make their own choices, and we hope that they will educate themselves. And if any of you are going into healthcare, we hope that um, if you come across people with ALS that you'll contact us or work on realizing that people with ALS do need a large support team of many different professions, um, you know, not just medical professions, legal, other things like that, a large support team. Well, thank you. Um, I am a nurse, I am um, a, a mom and a wife, and I am a patient with ALS. So I thought I'd just start out by asking you just to contemplate, what do you fear? Do you fear? failure? Do you feel change? Do you fear aging? Do you fear death? I have to say that my greatest fear came true when I was diagnosed with ALS, or also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, December 23rd, 2009. And it was kind of the ultimate irony because I just celebrated my 25th wedding anniversary eight days prior, and it was three days prior to Christmas. So in the prime of my life, I'm 47 years old, which is on the younger spectrum of um, people that are affected by ALS. Uh, I was dealing with probably one of the worst fears of my life, a diagnosis that 
was life limiting, um, where there was no cure, there's no treatment, and the potential of what's going to happen to me. Um, as a hospice nurse and a registered nurse, I knew what I was facing. Um, the progression is such, a Karen implied that um, can be starting with one part of the body and then kind of progressively moves to complete paralysis to the point where I'll no longer be able to speak, um, smile, swallow, or even to the point where I breathe. And there's gonna come a time in my life when I need to make that decision, as Karen mentioned, with um, the advanced directives, which is making a decision whether I wanna continue on advanced life support, which is a respirator that breathes for me, um, whether I want a tube feeding because I can't feed myself. Um, and those are very, very uh, decision, great decisions that I thought, I, I've always thought as a hospice nurse, you know, no. I'll never make that decision, but I can't say now that I'm actually facing what I'm facing that um, when the time comes that I may not choose that for, m for myself. So anyway, um, I think that to understand my fears, you need to know just a little bit more about me. I grew up in a very active family. We um, skied, we hiked, we did just about anything outdoors. It was our, our way of life. We loved to camp instead of staying in motels. Um, during my college days, I became a professional ski instructor. And um, I like to think that the only way I knew how to get down the mountain and through life was going as fast as possible. So <laughs> um, I always look for the challenging things in, in life. And so um, I also, my, my, I guess me was just walking fast, talking fast, and uh, running upstairs. Kind of one of the unfortunate things that I face right now is, you know, I look up those stairs and I think, to me, that's Mount Everest. Whereas just a year ago, I would have been running up the stairs. Um, most of my career has been spent in home care and, and hospice. Um, I've worked from bedside to boardroom as a visiting nurse and working my way up through uh, being an administrator. Um, during a 10-year hiatus, I started a uh, company that did home health aid and CNA training and um, started with only $500 and a vision that I was going to make a difference in, in, in nursing. And um, was a lot of ups and downs, you know, financial ups and downs, uh, legal ups and downs, partner ups and downs. Um, eventually was acquired by a nonprofit organization that eventually shut us down in 2003. So, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've understood challenges in, in my life. But I think that one of the things that I've found um, in facing a um, life-limiting illness is that challenges and heartaches in life um, can really turn out to be opportunities for change and growth. I spent 14 years trying to achieve my master's degree in business. I had been through um, three different universities. We had moved. Um, I was paying my own way, never took out a loan to, to do this. And I uh, finally achieved my master's degree after 14 years. I had a goal that I was gonna get it before my daughter went to college, so, which I did. Um, some would say, like to say that I'm stubborn, but I like to think that I'm persistent. So I don't give up easily. I like to think of it in the positive form. Um, I restarted a marketing and business development program for South Shore Hospital's home health hospice and private duty division. And then um, along came an opportunity for me to start a hospice, um, Epic Hospice Care, which is now called Life Choices Hospice. And that led me to a career as a consultant where I worked nationally. Um, which led me to become a, a surveyor for a national accreditation group, um, which last year led to uh, myself and, and a colleague opening a national consulting firm for hospice, home health, and private duty. So um, things, you never know where things are going to lead you, certainly. It wasn't like I started out thinking this was what, what I was going to be doing in life. Um, I th like Maury it, in, in the book, where Maury was a very um, independent sort. And he really kind of chose his own path through life. He didn't listen to what the uh, naysayers were, were saying. Um, I think I've chosen to ignore the masses and kind of kind of drive my own way. So um, yeah, I think you'll find that society likes to pigeonhole people, probably because it's convenient. 
Many try to dissuade you or imply or tell you that you can't do something, but I think that you can choose to listen or you can choose to do what's right for you. Because as Maury said, dying is only one thing to be sad over. Living unhappily is something else. While my professional life was in high gear, I began to struggle physically um, back in the spring of 2009. Um, strangely, a diagnosis of ALS provided a sense of peace by putting a name to what was happening to my body over the past year. It started with my left toes having some very strange cramping, more than just occasional, um, and then I started to develop a really deep fatigue in my left calf, which then began to um, progress to my le left foot uh, dragging. And I was traveling for work as a consultant, as a surveyor. I traveled literally every week last year. I was in just about every airport in this country, many of which, if you travel, you know, are very long. And I started to notice that my foot wasn't cooperating with me. Um, by the fall of 2009, it was a taxing effort for me to climb stairs, which again, as I said, was so unusual for me because I always ran upstairs. Um, and eventually, I started to think it was ALS. It was one of those things where, I mean, I knew what ALS was, although I hadn't had a lot of um, exposure to it because of the fact that there really aren't too many of us um, that have this disease but started to look on the internet, which ha is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> so, um, and, and started thinking, hmm, this is kind of sounding. And I had talked with um, my business partner, who was also a nurse, and she had kind of posed that too. But the, the final aspect came in the early December when I was um, at a conference for uh, the accreditation agency in DC with a hundred colleagues and I had the most humiliating fall in front of everybody. And I realized that I, I had to put a name to this. This, this wasn't something that was, um, I, I could sit back any longer and just keep going through test after test. Um, by that point, I had had four EMG and nerve conduction studies. And so if you've never had one, I hope you never have to. It's um, one where they put a device up to your muscles and they send a current through, and it feels like you're being tased. It's just kind of a jerky sensation. The second um, is where they stick a needle into the muscles, and they kind of move it around, and they, they can hear the, the waves, the electrical waves. So it's not painful per se, but it's certainly not a comfortable test. And unfortunately, I had to endure four of these tests before um, a diagnosis was made. Um, I felt like my body was disintegrating around me, and that I got to the point where I was begging my physicians for a diagnosis. Um, I, I even was saying that what it's going to take, me in a wheelchair before we put a name to what's going on with, with my body. So um, as a hospice nurse, I knew that there's a strange dance that occurs between patients and physicians during that time uh, prior to a uh, devastating prognosis. And um, maybe it's fear of failure or lack of knowledge or the fact that there is a lack of treatment, particularly in the case of ALS, there is no cure. Um, there really is only one FDA-approved drug that does not stop the progression of the disease, but in fact, um, on average, in studies showed that it gave about 11 weeks more to life, about three months' time. And the fact is that it is extremely costly, um, part in because there aren't too many of us with ALS, so that it doesn't drive down costs of the medication, um, and um, part because many patients with ALS don't choose to take this drug. I know Karen mentioned $300, but I have to tell you that for those people who don't have good drug coverage or don't have drug coverage at all, um, it can be upwards of $1,200 per month. So you can see, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's not doable for, for an awful lot of patients. Um, I myself chose to uh, apply through the drug company for compassionate um, assistance. And so I am getting the drug paid for by Sanofi Aventis, which is a wonderful thing. So one of those things I just want to throw out there is for any drug, um, if somebody's having difficulty with managing the cost of it, is to always think about applying. Um, to see if there can be some financial assistance. 
My goal before diagnosis was really to main, maintain my functional status and to stay out of the wheelchair as long as possible. Um, I did a lot of research on the web. Uh, their cl clinical trials are uh, always posted on the web through the NIH and then through different organizations, including the ALS Association. And um, I found a clinical trial through Mass General Hospital, which involved twice daily infusions through a central venous catheter of ceftriaxone, which is a well-known antibiotic. Typically, it treats um, Lyme disease for uh, um, extended cases of, of Lyme disease. This was different, though, because in studies, ceftriaxone was shown to um, in, uh, decrease the progression of symptoms in the mouse model. Uh, by creating a, a protein that was protective to the motor neurons, which are the ones that are affected and are die off, essentially. Um, my husband, Rich, and my daughter, Marissa, were trained how to perform the infusion and to do the weekly dressing changes. And it was a huge commitment, I have to say. This isn't for everyone. It involved me going at, in to Mass General and having surgically placed a central venous catheter, which is in my uh, vena cava. Um, it involved my husband who, uh, and my daughter, who are both not nurses, and that's kind of an irony in life, too, is as a nurse, I always thought I'd be the caregiver, and now I'm the person receiving the care. Um, learning to be a nurse in a very quick period of time, it involves giving a drug at a very high excessive dose um, twice a day, which is a, a complete... Um, infringement on my life, I have to say, because you have to get up early enough to, to, uh, to defrost the, the drug, and then there's a whole prep and set up and the infusion. It takes probably a couple hours a day. Um, about a month after taking the drug, I started to develop gallstones. Gall, gallbladder sludge, they call it, is a high, um, is a very common side effect with high doses of triaxone. And so I had to decrease the dose. Um, I went off the dose for a month. I decreased to once a day. And then by July, I was able to start back on twice a day again. Um, but recently, I've discovered I've got gallstones again. So I'm kind of facing uh, some more medical challenges. Uh, the thing is, though, that I found that on the time when I was off the drug, my symptoms started to appear again in my left hand, the weakness, the, the cramping, the deep fatigue. And when I bet went back on the twice a day, the symptoms started to disappear. So although um, I don't know if I'm on the real drug or the placebo, because it is a double-blind study, um, I, I do believe that in, in my case, uh, it is making a difference, maybe not so much as um, preventing the symptoms, the progression, but slowing the progression. And certainly, again, my goal is to stay out of the wheelchair as long as I possibly can. Um, I'm a huge proponent of, of uh, research because, as I've mentioned, there is no cure. There's no viable treatment, even. And, and so we need people such as myself with ALS, um, as well as yourself, who, who don't have ALS. Uh, some, some trials do require people that don't have ALS for things such as biomarkers, which is taking blood to see if there are certain biomarkers in people where we can uh, develop some uh, drugs and treatments that are targeted specifically for certain patients. Um, I've participated in that, and my family has too. Um, another study that I participated in was a strength testing machine. Believe it or not, um, we have very um, in, uh, inaccurate strength testing machines that really kind of depend on the physical force of the person who is giving the test. So uh, this was a machine that was wonderful. It was a chair that was very easy to sit in that um, I pushed against resistance and, and then it fed into the computer to be read um, uh, through technology. So we're looking at that as being a much more precise measurement of, of strength. And strength for people with ALS is a measure of our decline. It, it, it tells people how we're doing and where we are in the disease process. And finally, um, I was just approached by uh, a, a group that is looking at voice technology. As I mentioned, um, my voice will probably begin to fade, and I may not be able to speak at some point. 
but the beautiful thing is that there is technology out there for us to, to be able to communicate. And it's through um, even things such as the, uh, the iPad, the iTouch. Um, right now, the technology is such that I will be able to um, press a button or key in certain words, and the uh, computer will talk for me, but it's a, someone else's voice. Uh, this technology that I'll be doing a study for will actually record my voice uh, over about a six hour period and then take it and synthesize it so that when I type into the computer, what will talk will be me with my voice and my inflection. So a lot of really exciting things happening in research um, that you know, obviously you can see from what I've talked about uh, involves so many disciplines. A lot of people have asked what they can do to help, and certainly in the addition to prayer, which I deeply appreciate and I can feel the love, um, I'm asking that uh, people get in involved in a couple ways. First of all, you're, part of what you're doing today is um, getting involved. It's, it's finding out what's more about this disease, what can I do? I think that donations, no matter how small, even a dollar in a year, make a difference in programs such as the ALS Association, who I've benefited from tremendously. Certain, uh, certainly Karen's been a big, big help. I'd like to just um, give kudos to Karen, because in the midst of, yay, <laughs> in the midst of facing such a devastating disease, Karen picked up the phone and called me and said, she wanted to come out and visit. And I'm thinking to myself, oh dear God, I, I don't need a social worker. <laughs> We've talked about this. No one really wants a social worker to come to their house. No, no. Um, but she came, you know, she came under another guise, like she had information or something. And I, I, I was more practical. I wanted to find out more of what I needed to do to plan for the future. So she came, spent so much time with me, and has really made a difference in, in my life. Um, the ALS Association also has groups that they sponsor for support that I participate in, and I try to get others to participate in, too. Um, the loner closet she mentioned, we have definitely uh, benefited from, because what happens is you need certain equipment along the way. For right now, um, I do have walkers, and um, I use them when I'm out, like at the mall, because I, I don't have any strength. <laughs> To, to last a long period of time. But at some point, I'll be in a wheelchair and I won't need a walker, so that obviously the loner closet makes a huge difference for me. And then finally is just funding of, of research and clinics. Um, I uh, get my care at the Beth Israel Deaconess ALS uh, Clinic, which is a multidisciplinary clinic. And this is something that I want to mention to you, is that seeking care locally through neurologist is one thing, but Going to an ALS center that has multidisciplinary, that means that I meet with physician, I meet with speech therapy, I meet with occupational therapy, I meet with physical therapy, I meet with a social worker. It allows for me to um, better anticipate any kind of symptoms, manage symptoms better, and to really kind of um, feel better about what's going on in my life right now. So. Um, donations make a big difference. Um, you think about what donations have done for cancer research over the years, the things like the three-day walk, breast cancer walk, and a um, lot, lot of advertisements on television for cancer. Um, but I'd just like to say here that cancer has some very effective treatments. They've come a long, long way, and there are even some cancers that are potentially curable at this point. Again, with ALS, there's nothing. There's nothing for me out there. Um, and so I think that anything we can do to advance ALS research, um, whether you're looking to go into research, I think that's a great, great thing, too, is to consider that. Um, another interesting uh, aspect is that the CDC is debuting this fall a national ALS registry of which I'll get to participate in as an ALS patient. They are taking data from Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA and putting it into a database of all of those who have been diagnosed with ALS, including those who are deceased. And um, for those of us with ALS, they're asking us to create a login and go in and answer questionnaires about my lifestyle, about things that I've been exposed to, because we don't even know why people get this. 
You know, um, is, is it something environmental? Is it something in my diet? Is it something in my genetics? Is it something in the fact that other diseases can predispose this? I don't know if any of you heard, but in the New York Times there was an article recently about head injury, um, and that maybe Lou Gehrig actually died from head injury. Well, you know, I think that it, uh, we have to be cautious about articles like that because when you look at it, it was a very, very small sampling. I think it was only six to eight people that they actually looked at from cadavers. That's not enough to make a, a hypothesis on. So the ALS registry is something I'm very excited about because um, it's going to give us more information about not so much the fact that I have ALS, but we'll also begin to start looking at geographics, um, environment, and other possibly causal factors. I just want to say that um, I want to end this by saying that I'm not looking for sympathy, but I really want to convey to you a message of hope, love, family, and joyous living. Um, all along, my faith in God has never wavered but strengthened. Um, my life has really become richer by learning to live um, with patience, which I haven't really been known to have. <laughs> um, slowing down to enjoy moments with my husband, my daughter, my friends. Um, it's amazing how friends come out of the woodwork when they hear about tragedy, that's for sure. And I really appreciate that, too. Um, participating in a support group, I have a funny little story to tell you. Uh, I shared this with Karen. Um, during my first ALX clinic, when I had um, just been diagnosed, and you're at clinic where you have appointments all day long with each of the disciplines, and uh, Steve from the ALS Association, who also is a social worker, met with me before lunch. And... I knew that they were having a luncheon. They, held, they hold a luncheon for the clinic patients just as a kind of social hour kind of thing and because it's a long day too. And he asked me if I was going. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm looking at my husband thinking, oh, dear God, I don't want to see what I'm going to be. You know, I didn't... To, to, to be very, very honest with you, I'm a nurse and I'm a hospice nurse, but yet I guess I never realized that I was discriminated against people in wheelchairs or people in power wheelchairs who couldn't communicate. I had a deep-seated fear about the fact that I didn't know what was wrong with them and I didn't know how to communicate with them. So thankfully, Steve would not say, take no for an answer. He said, come on, come on, you know, it's free food. And I thought, okay, I can't say no and be rude to this man. So Rich and I went. And I have to tell you, that was probably the best thing I ever did because I very quickly realized in looking around the room that this wasn't a group of people that was sad and depressed. This is a group of people who, no matter where they were, even if they were in a wheelchair and not able to, to talk, possibly had um, life, were on life support or tube feeding, lived a, a relatively happy life, a very full life, um, and with a lot of humor. I think that the group ha uses humor an awful lot. So I just want to... to convey that to you that, you know, there is hope out there in, in many different forms. So again, what do you fear? What's holding you back? You know, although we may not have control over our own circumstances in life, we do have choices on how we approach living and how we are dealing with the roadblocks that each of us has. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to Laura for sharing her story. Um, not everybody who's going through this feels comfortable, and again, that's someone's choice. And for those of you going into healthcare, you'll find that out. It's up to every individual. Um, it makes my job easier when someone like Laura wants to come out and tell her story, but we also have to be respectful of people that, in an injury or an illness, want to maintain their privacy and stay home. So um, just looking at, to me, it comes down to a lot of letting each individual make their own choices. I think there's a couple minutes left, so I want to open it up to any questions, either in particular about ALS, or just if you're dealing with other people with disabilities, or facing an illness, or any challenges or emotional issues. I agree. I think that's a huge issue, and there has been more concern lately. Um, I think 
those of us in healthcare 20, 40 years ago, people with illnesses or disabilities might have been in a state school, a hospital, or a nursing home. And nowadays, more people want to live in their home. So again, it's coming down to the family, friends to help. And the term you hear often is caregiver burnout or caregiver exhaustion. Just one tiny thing that we do is that once a month, uh, my supervisor, Barbara, holds a caregiver virtual support group. And this is recognizing that our caregivers can't come out and go to a support group like Laura attends or that I lead. So we have sent people web cameras. And if someone has um, internet access, they can join us once a month for a caregiver support group. A lot of the local um, elder care agencies also offer caregiver support groups. Um, uh, elder care, visiting nurse or hospice might often. I think in the past we looked at it as, um, let's just have the caregivers talk about how they're feeling stressed or they're feeling exhausted or they're feeling frustrated that the insurance company won't pay for something. And now a lot of us in healthcare are looking at trying to prevent the caregiver from getting to the point of exhaustion. So now we also have a caregiver class that we're teaching. And again, also a visiting nurse elder care might be offered as well. But to give the caregivers strategies to try to prevent that, um, just to summarize it very quickly, one of the biggest things is that people have to ask for help and accept the help. And that's often at the cost of your privacy or your sanity of um, how many different people are you going to let into your house at all hours of the night to help take care of you. Um, often I have to tell the primary caregiver that they have to get out of the house or take a break from the caregiving. Uh, my main concern a lot of times is I see that caregivers, they're not going to the dentist, they're not going to the doctor, they're not getting their own prescriptions filled because they feel that around the clock they have to take care of the person. So sometimes it's a matter of telling the primary caregiver, um, we're kicking you out of the house, we're locking you out of the house, you need to go out for two hours. Um, but it, you know, you hear the saying of the book, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to take care of someone who is terminally ill. So I think um, if you are working with an agency or ask a social worker, but there is more out there as far as um, instructing the caregiver and trying to work with the caregiver as well, because um, many caregivers put their own health at risk. Um, caregivers you know, they're lifting people in and out of bed, so they're pulling out their back, and you say, all right, you have to use a Hoyer lift. The caregiver's exhausted, so a lot of times the caregiver, I think, needs just as much support as the patient does. Do you wanna yeah, add to that? Yeah, I just wanna mention that, um, un unfortunately, um, it, it does take a village. It, it, most of the caregiving falls on the backs of family, and, and there are um, few funding sources really to assist with long-term care. You know, certainly um, home health is paid, paid for by insurance is episodic. It just you know, is a certain period of time and then it ends. But the long-term care that's needed and, and the increasing level of care um, can be uh, very costly. And so funding is always a consideration. I have to say though that going through an uh, organization such as the ALS Association, they're a great clearinghouse of what types of programs are available out there and a good resource for people. It just mostly we, we see a two options for people with ALS when it gets to the point that someone can't be left home alone and needs care. A visiting nurse might provide a short amount of care if someone has a scalable need. Um, you've just had a feeding tube, visiting nurse might come in for about three weeks. Um, so that's not a long-term solution for people with ALS. The two general paths are if someone is exhibiting um, symptoms that shows that they might be approaching the end of their life, they may qualify for hospice, and that's certainly Laura's area of expertise. Um, and hospice can send in a whole team of staff, but again, it does not provide around-the-clock care. Another option for someone who is not at the point of qualifying for hospice or just doesn't want to choose to accept hospice is to go through what's called in Massachusetts the personal care attendant program. Someone has to apply for Mass Health, Medicaid, which is very challenging, and then they need to apply for the personal care attendant program, which is statewide, and um, every town in Massachusetts is covered by a certain area office. Someone from that area office will come to the home and evaluate you and decide, um, they, you know, they ask you a whole bunch of questions, and based on your care needs, they will determine, okay, we're gonna give you 40 hours a week for the personal care attendant program. The catch is you have to find and hire your own personal care attendant 
So if you have a friend or a neighbor or a family member who wants to come take care of you, great, you can pay them. But it's a certain number of hours a week, and the pay is minimal. I want to say it's around $11 an hour. So it can be challenging for some people to find someone to come take care of them who can work for that amount of pay. Um, so again, there are some supports in place, but it, it does come back to the family and friends because there is not a 24-hour day care situation for home care. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Um, my question was, is there any hypothesis at all of what causes ALS? Do you have any idea of how this disease structures are? Um, th th there are multiple hypotheses, and, I, and there are multiple um, areas of research going on based on that, but the simple answer is no. You know, and, and I think that one of the things is that we really haven't started looking at the entire population to see if there's any, anything that are similar with patients. One, we, um, some people here in Massachusetts are participating in a research study um, in the New Hampshire area that is looking at the possibility that there is some type of contamination in lakes or ponds or water. And that's a current research, but it doesn't mean that that's thought to be the answer. Another area of research they looked into is that people were working around chemicals or metal. Um, and again, for just as many people that will say to you that, oh yeah, I was around water, I was working with chemicals or metal, there'll be just as many people that say they don't know if that's in their background. Uh, they're also looking into cigarette smoking, which I don't think is thought to cause it, but could certainly exasperate it. So. Um, that's getting back to the registry, um, is looking at every person who's diagnosed, it will be a law. We started here in Massachusetts, it will be statewide that everybody who is diagnosed by a neurologist to have ALS, they would be registered online with the name and address, and then they would fill out questionnaires about where they've lived, where they're in the military, what kind of work, to try to look for patterns. But at this point, no, there isn't a definite answer about what causes it. I think there was a uh, question back here. <laughs> She's the hospice expert. <laughs> uh, yes, that, that's a simple answer. Uh, much like end-stage renal disease and dialysis precludes from hospice participation, but there's, um, it, for somebody that is on uh, artificial respiration, um, hospice services are very helpful in helping to, if they want, choose to go off the technology. So any kind of advanced life support would be helpful. Right. Right, so because hospice doesn't seek to prolong life, but it doesn't seek to end life, so it's it's a palliative measure. I think it comes down to some financial issues. If you won the lottery, you could pay for whatever care you needed, but usually you'll find if you have insurance, and a lot of people nowadays don't. If you have insurance, it's apples and oranges. Your insurance could pay for you to have the life support, the respirator, and the care that goes with that, or they will pay for you to have hospice. We have had some people go on the respirator, try it for an amount of time, and then elect to turn it off. So that's also, but it, a lot of times it comes down to what your health insurance will cover, and they will cover one but not the other. You are getting better. <laughs> That's a huge issue. <laughs> yeah, particularly for OT, because OT is not a qualifying skill. Um, it's a supplementary, but you can continue on after everyone else has pulled out. But the bottom line was that Medicare was never designed as an insurance for long-term care. It was episodic. It was for acute episodes and for um, rehab, you know, for functional maintenance. So uh, unfortunately, there, there really isn't a way to keep OT in there for long periods of time. Now, at any period of decline, there may, may be um, a new reason for home care to get involved. So it's always worthwhile to stay in touch with the agency. Yeah. 
had a question over here. Excellent. <laughs> um, my agency is entirely based on donations and grants. We have large events, um, probably the closest one to here. Um, last Christmas we had a walk. We do a lot of walk events in Fairhaven. If anyone's interested, um, October 3rd at Gillette Stadium we have a walk. We also love it when people suggest individual fundraising. Sometimes the individual fundraiser goes to a particular patient or particular family. You can also donate it just, you know, to write my paycheck. Thank you, I'd like that. Um, sometimes people want the money to go to specifically for research. So any donations or events to my agency are always welcome. And if you can individualize them with a hobby or an interest or where you want the money to go to, that would be great. Um, that's our biggest concern right now in the recession. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here in Massachusetts, I mentioned we were the first state to have the ALS registry. This is something that my agency worked on for about six years, raising money. We go to the state house every year. Laura went with us and her family this past spring. And we would ask for money for the registry. And that was actually funded through the Department of Public Health here in Massachusetts. And the goal was that we would have one or two full-time nurses who would not just you know read the data coming in but really look at it and also our dream was that we would have nurses who would really be able to go out in the field and meet with people with ALS and interview them and to try to get to the bottom um, with the budget cutbacks in the state of Massachusetts unfortunately we've had level funding and cutbacks in the registry um, so this past year at the State House that was one of the things we were asking for was money for the registry because we really feel that until we can know where ALS is we you know we we just we need to find out who's been diagnosed with it just as the basis for all research. We've also been hoping that Massachusetts would be looking at respite care. I've been on a committee that is looking at providing respite care. Um, right now, the state has offered some respite care, and that's just a small amount of where someone comes to your house to relieve the caregiver. Might just be two hours a week. Traditionally, the state has offered respite to some populations, like people with developmental disabilities. And what we've been working on with a national coalition is to have respite offered through anybody where there's a disability or a terminal disease. So instead of saying, well, these people with developmental disability can get this respite, and these people who are blind can get respite, and these people with ALS can get respite, but organizing it through the state um, just to make it one program. So that's something that we're hoping that Massachusetts would be able to fund is respite help to prevent caregiver exhaustion. It also keeps people from needing nursing home or hospital or more expensive care. So it's one of those things that maybe if you can get a few hours of help a day in the house, you don't have to be in a nursing home, you don't have to be in the hospital, it's keeping care down. Um, money for research is always something that we're asking for. And I'll let Laura add to that. Yeah. I'll mention on the federal level, we had the um, great honor of going to uh, Congress to advocate this year. And we were asking in particular for, you'll be interested in, um, uh, funding for about $15 million for the DOD uh, for research, ALS research uh, for veterans. And the benefit of that is uh, obviously um, veterans have twice the incidence that the general population does of ALS. And the interesting aspect of that is that it's not specific to any war or any particular theater. So it's pretty much all veterans um, are have the potential. and. The, the other benefit is that because it's funded through the DOD, um, and it, it's, it's not an earmark, it's an actual line item, um, that research then will then trickle over into the general population of which I'll benefit from too. So instead of uh, earmarking money from the general budget, this is already something that was on a line item for the DOD. The other thing is with the uh, Center for Disease Control that that was uh, something that had been advocated in years past and was, was passed, I think, in 2009, and that was uh, con congressional also. So those are two ways that we've really made a difference with advocacy. Go ahead. Just 
I feel, I mean, from my point of view, I see a lot of people with ALS. Um, I think what I'm seeing just in my caseload is younger people being diagnosed with ALS um, and also younger people with younger children. And that to me is the most heartbreaking because I think the way our healthcare system is designed is that if you cannot get sick until you're 62 and you can cut Social Security and Medicare and you've paid off your mortgage and you've raised your children, then it's okay to get sick. Um, but now it's with the economy and the recession, it's very challenging um, to see people diagnosed younger, you know, before they're done raising their family or before they're financially secure. A lot of the issues around the diagnosis come back to when and is someone actually and accurately diagnosed. And you said that you needed four tests, many doctor's appointments, and Laura's someone who is very well educated, works in the healthcare field, speaks up for herself, speaks English, and has insurance. So you can only imagine that if we're working with someone that doesn't have insurance, that English is not their first language, that maybe is shy, um, you know, doesn't have the means to get into doctor's appointments. A lot of the ALS specialists are located in the city. So I've worked with some people who live in a rural area, and I say, can you get into Mass General to get a diagnosis? Can you get into Springfield or Worcester? You know, it's hard for people to think, okay, now I gotta get a ride, you know, an hour or two into a city, pay to park. Um, so there's definitely a lot of limitations on the healthcare that make it harder to get the actual diagnosis. Um, the registry is making it more apparent, the number of diagnoses before we didn't know. How, if people would choose to contact our agency and we might keep track that way, but the registry is really gonna change that because we will get a better idea of how many people have actually been diagnosed with ALS. And I would not be surprised if with the National Registry we saw a lot more people that we no one knew about. <laughs> It may just be better information as opposed to an actual rise in the number of cases, though. Um, just generally, if you have mass health, is it easier to get in? Um, so yeah, we'll, in, in my staff, we kind of joke that if you have ALS, you should either have so little money that you can qualify for mass health or you need to win the lottery. Um, mass health actually does provide a good amount of services for people. Um, one of the hardest things people have to do is apply for MassHealth. Um, it's a lot of paperwork. Some benefits like disability you can apply for online. MassHealth is still a paper application. So um, I've seen it in Spanish, but if you speak Chinese or other languages, it can be a challenge. So it's hard if you get a thick stack of papers and you're supposed to fill it out and you're supposed to provide your W-2 forms, your checks. Um, you know, it's a lot of work to apply for Mass Health and qualify. Sometimes people apply for Mass Health and are declined, and I say, okay, now you got to apply again. Um, it's a lot of work to apply for Mass Health, even when I meet people that I know are truly qualified for it. Um, it's submitting your financial records, and also you have to submit um, medical proof as well. So it's a two-part qualification, financial and medical. Um, some people don't want to apply for Mass Health because there's a stigma attached to it that. It's welfare, that's for poor people. I don't want to apply for that. Um, some people don't apply for Mass Health because they feel it's an invasion of their privacy. I know how much money I make. I know what my taxes are. Why do I have to send copies of that to somebody in an office? Um, so a lot of times people could qualify for Mass Health, but there's a lot of barriers to them applying for it and accepting for it. There's also, um, there can be financial ramifications down the road. If someone has mass health and they are a homeowner, after they, let's say someone's had mass health and they've had the personal care attendant program, the state can attach a lien to the sale of your house after your death. So some people don't want to go the mass health route for fear that their family will lose out on an inheritance from a sale of the house. So that's a complicated process. I can help people apply for mass health, but if they own a home, I suggest they work with a lawyer. But there are benefits mass health can cover a limited amount of home care and cheaper prescriptions, and also co-pays. Many insurances only cover 80% of something. So you can say, oh, Blue Cross Blue Shield will pay 80% of your power wheelchair. Well, a power wheelchair can cost $40,000, so that means your co-pay is $8,000. And I'm pretty sure most of us don't have $8,000 around for co-pay. So sometimes even when people do have good insurance, they get MassHealth as a backup to cover many of the things that insurance doesn't cover. 
Um, so we found that just even when people have insurance, it's hard for them to hear that insurance won't pay for that or insurance only pays 80%. I just want to say what I see differently from the book is that just to point out, Maury was someone who enjoyed financial security or stability, um, so that certainly makes it a lot easier. I have some people with ALS that they can't pay their rent, they're worried about getting evicted, they have to move in with other people. So um, I think Maury's journey with ALS might have been better than most people because he was financially secure and he did have a spouse living with him. Um, one of the, the hardest challenges I see sometimes is a lot of people are not married, they don't have a significant other, they're not in a relationship, and it's also not unusual for someone to tell me that um, their partner or spouse left them because the stress of dealing with an illness like ALS is so high. Um, so that was one of the benefits I see with Maury. He, you know, I think his house was paid for, he had um, that financial security, he had some family members around. It's not unusual for people to live apart from their family. Um, a lot of people have traveled around the country for military education, jobs, and often find they're facing an illness far from home and far from their family. Um, the other thing, um, I think Maury was like Laura and that um, someone who was willing to be very public about his illness and speak out about it, um, and not everyone is that comfortable. Some people are really suffering from depression or anxiety, and it limits them from being able to be open about it or accept help from other people. Um, and some people just aren't comfortable talking about death um, based on just your opinions, your religion, your cultural. Um, he was able to talk about dying. He was able to say goodbye to people, and not everybody with ALS has that comfort level with it. Uh, but I do think the book is an excellent overview of ALS. Another good book, if you're interested in ALS, is Tales from the Bed. Um, that was written by a young woman living in New York City. And again, she was someone that was also financially secure and did a lot of education and outreach and publicity about ALS. And not everybody has the means or the comfort to be in the spotlight. Not everyone like Laura. I reread the book, and I watched the movie, too. Um, so for those of you who have just watched the movie and haven't actually read the book, I do recommend you read the book because there are some differences there. Um, I would have to say that his, his approach was very similar to people with ALS that I interact with. I mean, and you have to understand is that I participate in support groups. I reach out. Um, so I don't necessarily... She's on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't necessarily see everybody that, that Karen does, but I'd say for the people um, who participate like me, um, very much have that same attitude where um, they're really enjoying every day for, for what it is and um, maybe not so much reflecting back. He reflected back a lot about his, his past and his past hurts and all. Um, I would say that most people that I know, like me, kind of just enjoy the day. You know, it's pretty cool to sit out on your back deck and just look at the trees and think, wow, I never noticed that before. And that's kind of what he was doing in the book. As far as the movie goes, I want to caution you on just a couple things. Just from a nursing perspective, there was one scene where the, the attendant is pounding on his back, and I thought, oh, dear God. <laughs> we don't do that. That's not chest PT. So, um, you know, there are uh, things just such as... That. <laughs> Disregard that scene. Um, the fact that he's in a non-motorized wheelchair um, is, is you know, there comes a point when we need special wheelchairs that allow for me to change position easily, to adjust for comfort level and for my blood pressure, um, to support my head because it's going to be, you know, there's no muscle to support it. So that's kind of a something that's a fallacy in, in the movie. Um, and I, I, I think that just, just the fact of the, the, little, the little tidbits on life that he was giving to people about, you know, just kind of reflecting on what, what's real and what's not. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for coming, and please come down and see us if you want material or more information. Thank you.